Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Master Chess Web Show. Oh, um, that was a good start. We had <laughs> Paul Littlewood for a fleeting moment. Now he's disappeared. So we're going to have to ad lib our way through the rest of this show. No, I'm here. I'm here. Sorry about okay, that. it was safe. The, right. the phone, safe typical right. the phone goes off. That's a tool with live, you know, television. <laughs> well, anyway, adds, adds, it shows that it is live and not recorded, yeah. uh, you know, uh, in a pristine manner. Anyway, welcome everybody to this uh, Master Chess Web Show. We're very pleased to be able to welcome international master Paul Littlewood, who uh, is a very famous chess player. He was British champion in 1981. And he has numerous uh, re times representing England in international events. And um, he is renowned for his entertaining and attacking style of chess. And it seems like his wife is joining him now. Uh, so it will be a little good family uh, <laughs> affair. <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is that um, welcome along, Paul. How are you this morning? Very well, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah. You've chosen a, a good, good selection of your games for us, but first of all, tell us something about your your background and your family, because you come from a very famous chess playing family, don't you? Yes, um, my father represented England, and also, um, many people will know him, John Littlewood, and he was a very fine player. Uh, unfortunately, he never did win the British Championship, though, though he became very close, and he's had some famous games. Uh, the game against Botvinnik is one that's been widely published, um, but he also beat some very strong players in, in his career, such as Liverich, for example. Uh, my uncle, also a very strong player, uh, he unfortunately died rather young, but he, he also represented England uh, at chess and was known as a problemist as well, produced some very fine problems. Uh, and my other uncle, Peter, in fact, was, a, was also a quite a good chess player, but he in, instead decided to play bridge, and he represented England at bridge. So <laughs> certainly a family where games uh, of chess, bridge, intellectual games were prevalent. Was um, the second person you mentioned Norman? Norman, that's right. Norman. Sorry, yes, Norman Littlewood, that's correct. Yes, Norman yeah. Littlewood, yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's got to be an advantage to, to, to be a member of a family like that, hasn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I think um, there's no truth to the rumour that uh, as soon as I was born, I was handed a chess piece by my dad. But <laughs> it, it almost felt like that at the time, because from a very early age, obviously, we, we saw him playing chess and I was keen to learn. And so was my sister. And so we learned chess from a very early age and uh, started to progress from there. Um, dad was interesting, though, because I don't think it, it wasn't one of these pushy dads at all. He He kind of encouraged me to play but he, he I don't think he'd have worried if I didn't take up chess at all uh, but uh, I had a lot of interest in it and frankly I absorbed books uh, all kinds of things and joined a local club and just got very very interested in chess. Your dad was and, a head teacher wasn't he? Yeah my dad was a teacher uh, at uh, Skegness Grammar and he basically um, was very keen on chess himself, as we know. He, he uh, was quite keen to get juniors playing chess. Um, and obviously that helped me as well. And I remember, for instance, he was the captain of the Glorney Cup team. And the Glorney Cup team came to the house next door to stay over. And I met people, when I was about 11, I met these guys who were 14, 15 and quite keen players, such as Robert Bellin and so on. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. And I, it will help me in my development. Yeah, I mean, it shows his teaching skills that he actually encouraged you rather than uh, tried to make you do it. Exactly. And obviously, we went along. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how my mum put up with it, really, but we went on to the British Championship, all these children and my dad, and my dad played chess and my mum looked after all the kids, you know. But, you know, obviously, I was in that kind of chess environment from a very early age. Well, why don't you... Sorry, sorry, Nigel, go ahead. Uh, Andrew and I were having a conversation the other day. We, we said that all the argument and discussion have gone out of, of chess since computers arrived. But I, I believe it's alive and well in bridge. I mean, was what, that one of the attractions uh, to bridge, to have a good argument? 
<laughs> to be absolutely honest, you have to be careful because I actually play bridge with my wife, and that can be quite uh, an interesting situation. You know, when you have a discussion in inverted commas, you know, one has to be careful. But you know, there are arguments can arise. That's true. Um, chess is obviously much more of an individual game. Yeah, bridge is much more a partnership game and uh, different. You know, uh, don't you play bridge at a very high level? Sorry. Don't you play bridge at a very high level? I play a reasonably high level. I'm I'm kind of grandmaster in bridge. Yeah, and uh, you know I've won a few. <laughs> that sounds like a high level. <laughs> it, yes, but it's it's not as high as you think. Actually, the grandmaster in chess is a much higher level equivalent than a grandmaster in bridge. But uh, you know, it's still reasonably high level. I play for my county, and uh, I've won a few nation national competitions at bridge as well. Yeah, there you go. Well, why don't you show us one of your games? I mean, we've got a few brilliant games lined up here. And there's one you played against a guy called BP Andrews. So why don't, you, uh, why don't you take us through it and we'll try and ask sensible questions, which is always difficult for us, but uh, we'll give it a go. <laughs> yeah, right, OK. Uh, OK, now, can I move these? No, I, I, I was, I've got a screen here. I can't move these pieces uh, because I've got you, Nigel's you, you ID. Should, you should be able to. Can you move them yet? If you, you you can't move. You've got to you've got to go to the the. Web oh, I've got to do it to the box. Right. Ah, I see. Yeah. Have I? No, it's still not working. You should should be able to if you're logged on. I am logged on. Do the yeah. study. But it's just gone to your. It's gone to your. It's gone to your thing and not to mine. I don't know why. I, you've got your ID, but not. I, I don't seem to be able to do that anyway. Um, well, what, you let me move the pieces. You move the pieces. I'll tell you what. Yeah, you move yeah. the pieces, and I'll okay. tell you what. Paul, you can only move them on the web browser. You can't move them on the sh the screen share. Oh, I see. Right. Oh, so you you've got to have Lee Chess open in your web browser. You've got to have the study page open, and then you should be able to move the pieces. The trouble is, my screen is just dominated now by the. Well, do the, do do do. You've got to minimise it somewhat. Yeah, I'm so trying to go, right? just go to the top. Okay, you go oh, to I the see. top. It says view oh, options. So, options yeah. was, is it moving now? Yes, it is. Well done. Yeah, now I've got it. I've got control now. Yes, I understand. No, that's fine. Okay. You finally have control. control. <laughs> I have control. Right. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a, this is a, um, this is a standard Queen's Gambit accepted. And fun if it's a line I played as black against Beliaski many years ago uh, in the student Olympiad. So he's choosing a variation which I know a little bit about, and I actually looked at this variation quite cl closely. What, what, what? Where was this game played? Was it a four NCL or, or what? Was no, it? this was just a. It was just a, a national club match, I think, in the nineties. I can't remember the full details to be honest with you, but that was my uh, recollection of it. Um, the national club still existed. Yes, exactly. When we were, you know, you and I were playing for Wood Green. Uh, uh, if you remember Andrew and uh, Wood Green did quite well in the national club. Yeah, yeah, their their bridge talents were not that great, but they played pretty good chess. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> For those of you who are, you know who like traps, already here there's a nice little trap. White is threatening. If Black does something silly, like for example, uh, let me help you. Go there on. you go. Yeah, there you are. A silly move like that. There are I'll let my queen out. When I used to play, when I used to play simultaneous, as I would always play an IT five in this position because you know, <laughs> against against the youngsters, you know, inevitably they'd say, "Oh my God, he's left his queen on prize." You know, there he goes, and then then we take on f seven, oh mate. But you know, that's the kind of trap you've got to be a bit careful of. And uh, if you ever play me in a simultaneous, anybody, uh, try and avoid that one. Okay. Uh, if I was playing you in a simultaneous, I would play this move. Yes, exactly. And yeah. you'd, be, you'd be cheap on yourself. <laughs> I'd be very, very annoyed. <laughs> I'd have to go Queen D2 or something. Yes, it gets a bit boring. The audience um, will get the impression he's a bit of a flash Harry already. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll be fair. Oh, the, the, the best move, of course, is Bishop takes F7 check, and then you win a pawn for nothing, and followed by 19 5 check. Anyway, the, there we are. That's not the move I'd like to play. <laughs> Queen B3 may be pretty good as well. Anyway. Unfortunately, of course, in this position, Black can just simply develop his, and continue his development and stop that trap fairly easily. So that, that's it. normally, yeah. So <laughs> H3. I like to play H3 fairly early because I want him to commit that bishop first. If you play it a little bit later on, he might take an F3 and gain a tempo. So you do it early on, force his bishop back. Nice yeah. C3. 
a6, which is a waste of time. As Alec used to play that move, but they realise now they don't need to play it, and it does waste too much time, and we'll see in a minute why time now, is so important. Could you play, instead of castles, g4 here? Yes. That's Kasparov's method, isn't it? That is, yes. And then uh, if, if you play g4, he then, he, then, he then gets through this bishop with knight e5. Yeah. And then you go bishop f1, don't you? And then you go bishop f1 back to g2, correct. It goes kind of like this, knight e5, knight d7, something like this. And you take this yeah. here. Actually, you can't. Yes, you can. And you do. I mean, I'm not sure whether you do it here or not. But the, the, the basic plan is bishop f1 to g2 to solidify well, the king's side. And you've what do got you think two of that? Bishops. It's not too bad, but you know that's it's a little bit boring <laughs> and solid. You know, not my style. <laughs> so here we go. So we castle uh, knight b d seven and now e four. This is threatening to gain space with e five. Uh, I, th I thought um, knight b d seven is supposed to be a mistake, isn't knight c six the the normal move there? Well, knight c six is a perfectly good move as well. But obviously, that stops e four because of the d four pawn being on freeze, and yeah. and you know. Absolutely right. Knight c6 is perfectly good, yeah. I, uh, if, if we're talking about golden oldies, I, I actually won some games as black. It was a different move order. But uh, I, I would go here. My opponents yeah. went there. Yeah. And then I went here, and they would play e4. Of course, now now you can be a flash Harry again. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so take on d4 and bishop h2 check with the queen, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So we take, yeah. we take on f3 now. Yeah. I've got this a few times via a... Uh, or in defence. Most of them, uh, well, I think I got two games and I just took on d4. And uh, they, they didn't actually take with the queen. They, they realised, to their horror, they'd lost their d-pawn at that point. Yeah. It's quite shocking to see two such eminent players playing for cheapos. At such <laughs> no, we're not playing for cheapos. <laughs> what we're I doing is when I did this trap. <laughs> you don't need, we don't need any to see our way through these traps. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, though, you've got, what you've got to do is try and play normal developing moves, which in, include traps. Do you see what I mean? That's yeah, the point. Yeah, yeah. You're not playing for them. But you're just <laughs> developing in a way that includes traps. I mean, um, that's happened to me a number of times, uh, vice versa, uh, some, sometimes against me, sometimes for me. Anyway, so let's, have, let's carry on. Uh, knight bd7, e4, e5. Now the position gets interesting. Because now, obviously... Uh, it's going to get exciting. And here now we do g4. <laughs> the idea of g4 is that obviously if he plays his bishop back, I'm going to take on e5 and he's going to get into, into, into all kinds of trouble. Uh, so he, and, and the thing is, often we, when, when I was young, young, we used to worry about knight takes g4. But in this position, because the bishop can come back to e2, there's no danger from this pin and white, you know, is material up and black doesn't have much counterplay. For, for the material. So that's the reason why G taking on G4 is no good in this position. So naturally, he does E takes D4. Uh, and now it gets complicated. Now, when I was very young, I, I remember seeing the game uh, Spassky, I think it was against Bern, and uh, Spassky allowed Bern's pawn to go from D5 to, to E4 to F3 to G2 in consecutive moves. He didn't allow him to take the rook on H1. No, he was against Larry Evans. Yeah, was it against Evans? That's right. Kings Kings Indian. Indian. Yeah, same yeah, issue. Yeah. against Larry Evans. That's right. And and then Spassky <laughs> at the end of it played Rook H4. And I'd always had this, uh, you know, fantasy. Would I ever have a game where a pawn of my opponents captured along the diagonal all the way? And I thought well, it wouldn't be fantastic to have that. And I nearly had it in a game in the British Championship against Phil Sheard, uh, bless him, who unfortunately died quite young as well. Uh, and um, it, it, it was a, another game where I allowed a pawn to go along the diagonal. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite sound, and he should have drawn, but in the end, I won, but I was lucky. Um, anyway, so here we go. Watch this black pawn. E takes d4. D takes h5. Oh, dear. Take on c3. Now, inevitably, and I played here because I saw what was coming. Inevitably, in fact, when you put this in the computer, that's not the best move for white. The best move for white is queen b3 with a very strong attack. Okay, gives white plus three or something, or plus two and a half, according to the great stockfish or the Gila monsters, I call them. Plus 3.77. Yeah, exactly. 3. 3. 3. 30 plus. You're going to say that you couldn't resist it. I couldn't, couldn't because resist. I saw this line, I couldn't resist this. I mean, I, I, you know, 
And after E5, the black cannot escape the mayhem by playing knight B6, when white is still better, about plus one or something. But of course, he, yeah, yeah, he was tempted by this taking here. He thinks, well, he must take with the, must take with the bishop, and then, and then I've gained the tempo. But in this position, what he missed is I can now take this knight, which is a remarkable move. But this is, of course, what I saw when I played E5. Oh my God. And he, he was clearly, <laughs> obviously, he's going to he's gonna take a rook and he's going to promote to a queen. So his pawn has gone from E5 to A1 in successive moves. And I've achieved my aim of that, which I'd had since a youngster, that that could happen in one of my games. Uh, now, of course, White has to be fast. And in fact, as you might expect, it's a forced line. Bishop takes check. That pawn on h5 is really helping out. Exactly. Amazingly <laughs> enough, the pawn on h5 features. You wouldn't have thought it would feature, but in fact, guarding the g6 square is amazing. It makes the combination work. Now, of course, if he takes on f6, we have bishop g5, mate. Again, as you see, the pawn on h5 guarding g6. So <laughs> he goes king e8. <laughs> f7 check isolates his king. So now none of his pieces. And note those people, how important development is. The black bishop on f8 and rook on h8 undeveloped and the queen undeveloped and the poor king left on his own to try and survive. Now, you have to get it the right way around here. If you played bishop check first to g5 and then rook e1 check, unfortunately, this black queen then comes into its own. It can take on e1. So what you need to do is to get it the right way around and you play rook e1 check first. And then he plays knight e5. And then we come bishop g5 and it's mate. Beautiful. You're right. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a bit of a fantasy game. I mean, people might think I've made it up, but in fact, it did happen, amazingly enough. And yeah, my Lee, opponent... Lee Andrews gave up chess shortly after this game. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> to be fair to him, very sportingly, I saw he sent it into Chess Magazine one year just uh, and said, you know, I'd just like to show you this game that I lost, which I thought was quite uh, amazing. Yeah, didn't didn't he start like an oil company or something? <laughs> yeah, <so> it, was. <laughs> it was a shell company, yeah. <laughs> now, um, so there we are. That was very exciting, very enjoyable. Um, Would you say that game is typical of your style? No, not really. Not really. I, I, I like to play sharply, but um, it, it's, um, you know, I play sharply and I, I, I play interesting stuff. I mean, very, ever, ever since I was young, one of the first things I learned from my dad is that the obvious move isn't always correct. And if someone takes one of your pieces, you don't need to necessarily take it back. Look at all the possibilities. Look at all the different combinations. Look at what you can do instead. If you're going to defend against something, look at an aggressive way of doing it, where you can threaten something. All these things you learn, and I learned these from my dad when I was young, and it has become part of my style to always look for the unexpected and, and to try and um, play in an aggressive style, I mean, I, I do like to sacrifice if I can, but, you know, at the end of the day, you can't always sacrifice and you've got to produce some solid chess. So it's a mixture, yeah. It's really, I'm good, not advice, a, that. really good advice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my father, I think, was a, was, a, was a more tactical player than me, but he liked, I think the reason he didn't win the British Championship, whereas I did, was that he liked that little bit of solidity when he needed. He, you know, he just didn't, he needed to be more solid on occasion. Uh, get those halves instead of the zeros, and and that's what makes the difference. He wrote a brilliant book on the middle game, didn't he? Yes, he did. How to play the middle game in chess. Uh, which, funny enough, I just um, my mum found an old copy, and I I'd just been up there for Mother's Day, and she said, "You want this?" And so I I took one of the old copies of his that uh, How to Play the Middle Game in Chess. It's a lovely book. Yeah. You know, if that game that book has been reprinted in algebraic, it certainly should be if it hasn't. Because I've got an English descriptive copy. I don't think it has. I think I, I did a book, a, a book on tactics, which was done in algebra, but uh, I don't think my father's book has, no, no. Which is amazing, really, considering how good it is. No, no, it's an excellent book, as you say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, your book actually was published long after that, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And it was just a, it was just a kind of primer. They wanted a kind of primer. Crowwood Press wanted something. And uh, I tried to analyze the middle game tactics going through all the different tactics you know and to try and show how they arise and how you cope with them and how, how you counter them uh, so that everybody could see all the different tactics like p6 
pins, skewers, double attacks, discovered check, etc. Yeah. Really good book. I, I've recommended it to all the kids who I have taught over the years, and they've all liked it. So there you go. Good. Um, anyway, that was a fun game. Perhaps I should go through now uh, the more... What I would say, this is my... Uh, how do you put it? You know, Evergreen game or Immortal game. I think this is my Immortal game. This is the best game. Watson. The, no, 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 no. No, the set. We'll go through the third game. All oh, right. Uh, yeah, against Tony Miles. Now, Tony Miles. I'll try and be. I'll go through this. How much time have we got? We got. Yeah. Loads um, of time. We got. Yeah, loads of time. So the thing is, the game with Tony Miles was played in the Ark Masters. Now, the Ark Masters was a, a, a tournament which was created <laughs> by um, a very keen chess player. Who I've forgotten his name. Do you remember the name of the guy? Peter, Bar- Peter Bar- Barton, was it? Bar- yes, that's right. Peter, that's right. Now, he, he, he started off in his school in Sussex, and um, we, we used to go down there, all the top juniors, and play. And it was a very exciting tournament because uh, I, I've had some success that I've won it, and I also lost famously in the last round to Murray Chandler in a very tough game. Uh, so he overtook me. And it's been a tournament which I've always enjoyed. And mm. this was the game where I played Tony Miles. Now, Tony Miles uh, is obviously a very fine player. And, he, he, you know, he went on to beat Karpov and he, he's had tremendous success. Unfortunately, another player who died young. But uh, he, he, I was always impressed with Tony because whenever I played him, he, he actually always said to me, now, I looked at your game from five years ago and I thought that wasn't a very good move and I could exploit it and so on. His preparation was second to none. And he really was very professional. Uh, so in this game, I was kind of obviously very tentative. He, he was rated much higher than me. But I just wanted to give him a good game. So here we go. Um, uh, it was just shows the strength, strength of those tournaments. Because Miles was rated 2-5-6-5 five, at the time of this game. And he was playing a weekend tournament. You know. He was. But it was a very, it, there, there were good prizes. And... It was a very prestigious tournament. All the top junior players in England, or oh, well, all the top players, not, many, not just the juniors, but it was, it, I, there were a lot of good players in this. It was very exciting, you know. Um, Do you remember um, an incident at a certain farmhouse where we stayed one uh, art? Oh, yeah. Art <laughs> I do. I'm yeah, not sure we can mention that to the viewers. Well, I, I, I will mention it. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was a very funny story. <laughs> there were 10 title players staying at this farmhouse. We, we were put up in this local farmhouse. That, that was the deal. And, but there were only nine beds. <clears throat> One of them was a double bed. And so uh, the farmer said, well, you better make your own, uh, you better make the best you can out of it. And so everybody dashed to a single bed and the only two mugs left at the end who had to share this double bed were yours truly and Paul Littlewood. <laughs> so clearly this had no detrimental effect on your play because I think you went on to win the tournament there that weekend. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there you go. That was an interesting affair. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, I know, you know, it was quite amusing, wasn't it? Yeah, but they, she was a very nice lady who ran, who ran that place, wasn't it? We had a good I time. Think we, were, we were the only two married people there, so it was, it was okay. Yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the reasons why we, were, we, we, we had the double bed, that's right, yeah. <laughs> we're not married to each other, by the way. <laughs> anyway, carry on, carry on, do carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we won't go into that. Right, now, uh, C4, E5... Knight c3, knight f6. This is kind of reverse Sicilian, obviously, the English. Uh, I used to in my old days, but I mean, ridiculously, as a youngster, I played a reverse Mora Gambit with black, which of course is ridiculous, tempo down, but there we are. That's the kind of silly things one did. How did you manage that? I played this kind of opening. I would play D, you know, I'd play... How, how do you get it in? How do you get it Take in? c6. <laughs> God knows how I got it in, but I think if they played g3 yeah. or something, instead of, yeah. Instead of knight c3, I went e5. Like this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Almost, yeah. But, yeah. It, was... but it, it transposes into an exchange slav anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a tool. It's very boring, yes. Right at Paul Street. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I can't remember how. I think he must have gone g3 or something. So I went d5 and he took it. I went c6. So, so anyway, there we are. So ridiculous. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was big money in these tournaments. If you, if you play, at that time, if you're playing for big money, you don't go play the reverse Boric Gambit. I don't no, know. no, this this is a bit more serious. So this is a kind of just a reverse 
Sicilian River in English. Kind of, well, it's not a Sicilian even. It's a kind of close Sicilian, but uh, normal. And we get to this position here, which is quite normal position A3. Now, in this position, the normal, often the plan for black, by Barrick and various people, is to go H6, Knight A5, Knight H5, F5, and so on. And you play for a king side attack. Oh, I was one never... One question. One question before we go on. Go on, yes. Obviously. Okay, just dropping back one move to here. Now, yeah. a lot of uh, average players, they're thinking, is A5 necessary? You get the same situation the Queen's Gambit declined. Exchange variation. Should black play... Obviously, it's your opinion that black should play A5 here. Rather than yes. leave it and just continue with development, maybe play h6 and then bishop e6 and so on. What yes, think? that that I think it's I think it's debatable. I think there's an argument either way. The disadvantage of a5 is it, it, although it opens the a file for the black rook eventually, the white pieces can infiltrate via the a file uh, uh, and so and gives white something to attack. It is a debatable point. I mean, you played rook b8 later on to defend b7, giving up I the did. a file. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, so you know, maybe maybe a five wasn't necessary. It, just at the day, at the time, I, I chose it. But you know, I have actually seen some players wait and sometimes play later on a six and take on b five and transpose anyway. Do you know what I mean? They do it like that. But uh, so it, it's uh, it's not necessary. No, and uh, perhaps in future I might not play that because uh, opening up the queen side maybe to to white's advantage, not blacks. But we'll see what happened anyway. But it's just a thought. Yeah, you you've got a good point there. Okay. Well, I just think it's a question club players will ask. Indeed, indeed, and um, I think uh, I think there's a lot to be said for not playing a five and just developing uh, and getting on with the kingside attack. Anyway, let's see what happens. So a three. Now, in this reason, I choose rookie eight. This is a slightly different plan. I'm going to play in the center rather than on the king side. Now, I have to say, at the time, it just goes to show you. At the time, I thought. If black, white played b4, I would take, take, and then my intention was to play e4, to be honest with you. But the old dealer monster tells me that after this, rook takes b5 in this position, white is actually better because black's pieces get into a bit of an awkward situation. And it goes on something like knight d4, knight takes rook takes queen b3 and now with bishop b2 coming this rook is awkward on d4 and it says that white is slightly better so um about 0.4 or something better 0.5 or something so maybe uh i'm not sure whether i would play that but that was my intention looking at it afterwards after b4 a takes b4 a takes b4 an interesting move for black is knight d4 and this is the other possibility and again the position gets complicated. Okay, that's something. Now, the interesting point here is that Tony decided he didn't want to allow that. Whether he prepared this, I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether he knew I played this line, but I don't think we had much time to prepare in those days because, you know, the, there were two or three games a day, so I, I doubt whether he prepared this. He probably just played this on the spur of the moment. But it's not a very good move. Instead of b4, sorry, he played bishop g5. Now, his idea is to try and control the white squares in the centre. But the trouble is, I was happy after this move because after h6, bishop takes, queen takes, I have an unopposed black square bishop. And as you can see later on, that becomes a very big factor. The black square bishop potentially at the moment is not doing much, but it's there. It's like in the King's Indian defense when you're playing black. The black square bishop is the key to the King's Indian defense often. And this is, as we'll see later, Having an unopposed black square bishop with white having no black square bishop is very, very important. So it also, it also keeps your king safe, doesn't it? It does, yeah. And it makes the development fairly easy. Black's development now is fairly easy. Admittedly, white, though, has got very good control of the central white squares, and that's what he was hoping would be important, but it proves to be less of a factor. Mm. So off we go. Absolutely normal. This queen's a bit awkward here, so we bring it back. Uh, B5. 97. Now, as Andrew mentioned before, I could have the same position with the pawns on a7 and, and a2. Maybe that's a bit. Is, is there a nice little, there's a nice little trap there, isn't there? Go on, what's back in this position? If if white plays knight d2, is there some trap here with e4? Are you looking at e4, that idea? 
Yeah, and if Nike takes their five, yeah, is that, yes. that, that that's that's one of the ideas. That is a little trap. That's another little trap you have to bear in mind. <laughs> yes, yes, but. Uh, but if uh, if Knight takes, of course, White could just play Queen C two. But Knight, well, no, no, Knight D four. Yeah, no, it's it's awkward, isn't it? Actually, yeah. So well, he goes he goes Knight D five. Yeah, if Knight D five. Uh, there are actually some games. If you look down here, there, there's some game references. Oh right, uh, right. Yeah. So uh, is that is that better for White? No, can't be, can it? I mean, you know, how can that be better for White? Now the bishop is very strong on g7. Yes, I think I think that's okay. It's just a little, just a little aside. I mean, I might yeah, just a little aside. But yeah, I, so yes, he he first of all plays b5 here, and maybe Tony was aware of that. He he's aware of that situation of e4 because he plays queen b3 now in this position to guarding the knight on c3. So he's preventing any silly traps with e4. But of course, this gives white black a fairly easy development. Bishop e6, knight d2. Now, what I should have played here, actually, and I was I'm wrong, I should play c6 straight away. I actually inverted the moves, and later on I realized that was a mistake. Better would have been c6. And I can follow with rook b8 if I need to in a minute. But c6 first to stop the knight coming to d5. When I actually played rook b8, in fact, the Gila monster tells me that white can get a slight advantage with knight d5, which of course. Wouldn't have been possible if I played c6. But as it happens, he transposes effectively into what I, what I was thinking of. And so, okay, he's got control of the a-file, but I've got the center, and I'm going to come and expand, expand with d5. And black's position is comfortable. His bishop on e6, which is often gets hassled, has got no hassle at all. And it's a nice development for, for, for black. You've actually taken away his control of the light squares in the middle, haven't you? That's the point. And if I can get d5 in and maybe f5, and I, I really am going to be expanding in the center. And his counterplay on the queen side is a long way away. Well, you played but, d5 on the very next move. Indeed. Now, here he lost his sense of uh, danger because I think a, a tactician would be very, very worried about putting a rook on a square unguarded here. He's trying to put pressure on b7 and so on and trying to get a double on the a file. But look, that unguarded rook, yeah, it's, it's exposed to tactics, you know, queen b6 maybe in some points, knight c8 in some points. There are all kinds of dangers for putting a rook on garden, and this isn't a very good move. And so I go here, and he probably should have played, it should have guarded his rook with rook a1, but he didn't. He played rook c1. Now, again, I didn't look closely enough in this position. I decided to play for a slower kingside attack, which is quite good, but not the best. There is actually a very sharp move here, which takes advantage of the rook on a7. And it's, it was suggested again by, uh, by, by Stockfish, and that is the move e4, which looks amazing, because you, there's so many pieces on prees. Uh, sorry, a lot of sorry, a lot of white pieces guarding the e4 square, so it looks as though he's just sacrificing the pawn. But the point is that if he takes this, we then take this one here. And now the queen's hitting the knight on d2. And if he goes knight takes here, this move, as pointed out, knight c8. Nice. And attacks the rook on a7, and he's threatening to come to b6 and the knight on c4. We're also threatening queen, d, queen d4 in some lines. And it is basically winning a, a winning move for Black, yeah. And uh, so this move e4 would have given Black an advantage. He, he, he basically can't take the pawn on e4, and it's quite a struggle for him. And notice now, also, the bishop died, and it may come to d4 again, attacking the rook on a7. Just shows you how this rook on a7 is, is the cause of all White's problems. Well, you could also be threatening e3. And if he takes Indeed. queen b6, something like exactly. that. Exactly. E3, or, or. queen b6, knight e3, knight f5 coming as well, coming to e3. I mean, there's loads of loads of tactics, and they all favour black. So this move actually would have been very, very strong. And I have to say, I missed it. In fact, I, I, have, I have to confess that I didn't even look at it. I remember, I mean, it's a long time ago, but I do remember not even considering it. Because it shows how ingrained it was that the idea, I mean, this e4 pawn, you know, could be taken in so many ways. I just didn't look at this properly. Uh, yeah. uh, so I missed that. Anyway, uh, so I played a rather slower idea. Still quite a powerful idea. And it's it, h5. I'm trying to weaken this king side and bring my bishop into play. 
queen a2, h4. I won't dwell on these moves for too long now. No, carry on. It's really interesting. Knight f3. He's trying to re reconcile. And I, I do remember uh, certain games when I was younger when a pawn on h3 could be a real bane for white or a pawn on h6 similarly for black. So I pushed on this pawn to, to, and that pawn is always there. And later on you'll see how important it is. Bishop h1. Uh, again, he could have played bishop f1. That was another possibility, but he prefers to keep his bishop on the long diagonal. Maybe bishop f1 was slightly better, but that's, that's another point. Now the knight comes into f5. And as you can see, you know, white's got really nothing on the queen's side. Black is just controlling the centre. And, you know, he, he, as long as he's careful, he should be doing quite well. So white retreats. Now the bishop comes into play. This way round. That's a nice and as you can see, this is a nice, this diagonal again. Note now how suddenly this black square bishop is an incredibly powerful piece. And no opposition, as we remen remember we mentioned eight or nine moves ago that it's got no opposition and it can come very strong. Um, well, this show what happens after e3 when black white makes a mistake. If white makes a mistake, yes. Yeah. What, what, well, shows. I think I would. I, I I automatically would say knight takes without even thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, how does this work out? It's probably crushing, isn't it? Well, I, do you want to do it? I, I, I yeah, let, let's see. Go on, show it out. Bishop, Bishop takes, takes yeah, King, King F1. F1. Yeah. Now we've got, uh, well, we have, I mean, we can take, this rook is on prees, but we don't want to do that. I think we want to go Queen F6 take them. Then he has to put his something in the way. How's it looking like? And now we've we got take various the rook options. on C1. Bishop G4 is oh, possible. You can take the rook on C1. Take the rook on C1. <laughs> one. We've got so <laughs> many good moves. Bishop, <laughs> Bishop G4. I mean, it's just awful, isn't it? I mean, you know. I have to concede that's not too good for White. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> he, he didn't play that. However, it still features in the mirror. He played Rook D1. Again, he probably should have played Rook A1, but he played Rook D1 to guard this knight. He was trying to be protective. But now, Kaplonk comes Knight E3. Oh. Now, um, this was my, you know, part of my plan from earlier on. Again, note the bishop on the, the rook on a7 is always potentially on prees. You know, makes it difficult for White to, to for his queen. His queen can't move away from defending the rook and all these kind of things. Um, so he took this. I mean, he could move his rook, but it's better for Black. What so was his reaction when you played that move? Because he was always very expressive, Miles, wasn't he? Yes, to be fair, he, I, I don't recall him being surprised. You know, he, he's funny. He's, he's very phlegmatic sometimes. You know, you don't realise that it, he might be losing, but he never gives that away. He, he's quite good at keeping a poker face in these circumstances, you know? Uh, he calmly just took the knight, you know? I, I don't remember him getting flustered, but he clearly was a bit... Um, uh, King F1. Now there are a hundred moves which are supposed to be quite good here, but I mean, I just played a sensible one. I think Queen F6 check. Bishop yeah, F3. Yeah, a lot of pieces on pre, and they're all white. Now, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But here, you know, it's difficult to decide exactly what to do. What move are we? Twenty-eight. Yeah. Twenty-eight. Yeah. Yeah. There are possibilities, there are all kinds of possibilities. I was, I mean, you know, the trouble is, uh, the dealer monster is, of course, completely rational in these circumstances. I mean, can't you take the rook and go e4? I mean, that's buffy. Well. Yeah, that's possible. That's absolutely possible as well. Yeah, that, some, wins, yeah. that, that wins, um, wins a piece back and wins the exchange. Again, but I didn't want to necessarily just win the exchange, you know, against Miles. He can fight. <laughs> this is why I want, if here, <laughs> if here, I was worried about him doing this, you know, taking and taking here, you see what I mean? And, and, and but. Which he would have done for sure. Yes, but Stockfish tells me that Queen D4 now is a hugely strong move. Because you attack the rook on a7, obviously, and you're coming f5, and mm. maybe you're even going bishop g1. Do you see what I mean? And, mm. and it's just a very, very strong position for black. Now, <clears throat> you know, at the time, you were pawn down. It kind of looked quite good, but it wasn't, you know, I wasn't convinced, you know. But, you know, in the cold light of the day, that's, that is a very good line. Um, instead, I found another simpler idea, I thought, and I kind of saw this through. I played bishop here. The idea was to attack this knight on c3, and now I'm kind of trying to threaten e4. 
It's kind of an in-between move, that, isn't it? Is, is, is it almost a position zoo? It was a position zoo. Yes, attacking the knight on c3, he's got to make a decision. And he played... What did he play? He played rook a3. Obviously, yeah. he's got this rook out. Now, I played the very simple idea. Bishop takes c3, rook takes an e4, which wins a pawn and gives me a very strong position. That's the kind of practical decision that a, that a player makes. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if we can get a pawn up against Tony Miles with a comfortable position, we're happy. We know he can't really do much, and we've got to win all the winning chances. But, again, Stockfish tells me that even stronger this position is the move Queen G5, because it threatens Queen E3 with incredible consequences. And as you can see, the, the attack on the black squares becomes very, very powerful. That's not easy to see. No, it's not easy to see. I mean, he's, he's best, apparently, to put stops with his knight b3 when I just take the knight and get my piece back. But, you know, this, this, to threaten this here, it, it's actually very, very dangerous and, and, in fact, should give a winning attack. But I'm a piece down, you know? What I played, which to me was just, I, and what I saw was simple. I took this, took, and I played e4. Attacking the rook, on and so he's got to guard this. And so I now take this, and he plays knight takes this. I saw all the way through. Now d4, cutting off his pieces from the defence of the king. Very good. Rook, rook a3, and simply bishop g4. And now three five three five. I'm winning the pawn on f3. Pawn up, got control. Rook can come to e3. Got control of the file, and it should be winning. And, and so I saw that, and I saw that. Having seen a line which looked to me very good, I didn't consider Queen G5, which maybe in the cold light of days is better. But, you know, sometimes we have to make practical decisions, you know, in chess. Yeah. Anyway, from here on in, I was quite pleased that, uh, you know, when I looked at this with the computer, it kind of agreed with most of my moves. So that was quite nice. And it's actually quite, I mean, I'll go through this quite quickly because really black is just very, very strong. So I won't, I won't there's no need to take this pawn even now. I, Got such a strong position. You just build up, don't you? Yeah. He, but now he comes in. Pawn on d4. He's jamming his whole position up, isn't it? Exactly. That that was the point. The pawn on d4, in <laughs> fact, cuts him off. Rook takes queen. Rook here. Rook here. Still Take. very clinical and nice the way you think. Yeah. This is just straightforward. I'm not going to dwell to it. But now we just got this. I'm turning rookie one check, obviously. He's in an awkward position, and he's got a guard thing. He's still his queen is very passive. The main thing I wasn't letting his queen out of his out of its. It's having to guard the back rank. But notice how important the pawn on h3 is. That yeah. extra pawn of mine on h3 is is the key to the win. And so now I just simply solidify. There's no need to rush. I've got a nice winning position. There's nothing much he can do. He played here. I played here. Now I'm throwing queen b1 check. So he's got to do something. Right. He's got to go back. And I just keep him under pressure here. Now, if he um, he can't go King G1 anymore because of rookie one check, he, he's, he's struggling. And he, he, he played here. But now, I've got a nice winning combination which, which, which exploits this pawn on H3. And the point is that the, this suddenly, another reason I played C5, this white squared diagonal is absolutely massive. Queen b7 threatens mate on h, well, mate, well, winning material with queen h1 and, and mate, actually. And so he plays king g1 to stop king h1 mate, but now the rook on d2 is overloaded because of the mate on g2. And that was it. So that, that I was very pleased with that game because, frankly, you very rarely play a game where you feel as though you didn't make any mistakes. Okay, I might have played slightly better at one point with e4 instead of h5, but I, th I was pleased that, it, that the game flowed quite nicely and I kept control of it. And in the end, I didn't make any errors to let him off the hook. So it was I was very pleased. Very, uh, <coughs> beautiful game. <laughs> yeah. And um, I think, uh, you know. You consider it's, that your best? That's probably my best game. It's my immortal game, yeah. And I, I, you know, I doubt we'll ever play another game as good as that. That was uh, against such a strong player. You know, obviously you can play good get games against weaker players, which are, which are nice. But this was against a strong player, and so he put up uh, obviously resistance as best he could.
Yeah, I'm not. Was he in the world's top ten, top twenty at the time? He was at the time. I think he. I think somewhere. I, I think somewhere around here. I, I remember we went to Star with him, and that was when he uh, beat Mile, uh, beat uh, Karpov, didn't he, with the mm -hmm. famous A6. Yes, I remember all that. Yeah, yeah. It was a superb game. Um, uh, well, finally, let's... do you want to go through the last game? We can go very quickly through the last one if you want. Uh, we're not in a hurry. We're not in a hurry, honestly. <laughs> Really yeah, no, that's right. Okay, well, don't feel this, don't feel compelled to get off the air just because. No, no, no. This this was fun. There's probably nobody watching anyway. No, you know. you're quite safe. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, um, chess, as you say, well, is it my style to play aggressively and so on? Well, it can do. Of course, I can play aggressively and want to. If the position demands this, I'll really go for it. I'll tend to play energetically. Yeah, and if you want a bit of an aggression and a bit of going for it, this was a bit of fun. This was playing in the London League match. So, you know, we arrive uh, having been at work all day, both Willie and I, and uh, f feeling a bit knackered. You know, we've got to play our match and I'm playing for Wood Green. And Willie at the time actually used to, in fact, he got a reputation that he didn't really want to play at all. So he would turn up and offer a draw after a move or so to try and try so he could go home or go back to work because he was working in the legal profession. I think he was having to do lots and lots of work. I anyway. just remind the listeners that Willie Watson is a grandmaster. You know, you're not talking about any old player. Yeah, exactly. He's yeah. an England Willie international, <laughs> uh, exactly. whether he's at work or not. Yeah, I mean, he's still a fantastic player. And, uh, you know, we've had some great tussles in the past. I've been him a couple of times and he's been me. So we've, we've had some great games. Uh, but uh, one particular game was quoted to me recently where he played a beautiful combination against me and he won very nicely. And I saw it on Facebook. So uh, there we are. But anyway, this game was my revenge. <clears throat> the last game I've ever played against Willie. I haven't played him since. And it's all a bit of fun. I'm not going to commentate too much on it. It's just a bit of fun. So just enjoy a bit of... Good old fashioned hacking, as we would say in the, in the old trade. And draw this offered, is the draw offered, is it? <laughs> the, yes. <laughs> the, good old, the modern or the Piets or whatever you want to call it. You um, don't play the perk and then offer a draw, do you? Or move through? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm a simple man. I'm just going to exchange your bishops, you know, that black square bishop. The and, um, attack. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's very, it's very, um, you know, What's the name? Hacking like. I'm just stone edge like, basically. Uh, so he comes, hits the centre. I must keep this closed, obviously. And then he, then he decides to take. Now this is an interesting decision because he well, needs well, to have done that. Yeah. He's, what, about, what about knight takes e4 instead of bishop takes h6? Was knight takes e4 working? Why? Go, go back. Right to this position. Oh, I see. You're trying to. Right. Is that, was that working? Don't tell me it's working. I'll kill myself. It's working. Oh, it's a pawn sack. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Let's move uh, quickly on. <laughs> no, don't tell me. It's good to tell you. See, we're both so tired. We missed that. Knight takes e4 is pretty good, isn't it? Is that working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knight takes e4 wins a pawn. Yeah, okay. Right, okay. Well, I, there we are. I don't know if we draw them. No, so uh, anyway, so he didn't do that. Just shows you, see, what the life. So forget the opening. So we take this. Of course, the books now say, no, sorry, the computer says knight takes c6 is best. Get the pieces out. But he played the positional. Now we castle. And now he comes in the center. He takes c6. Knight takes d5 is quite a good move in this position, apparently. Uh, but, you know, I just wanted to attack him. So knight f3. <coughs> d4. It looks very dodgy for black without that bishop on g7. Yeah, the point is he could have played knight g4 at any point and driven this queen away, but now he can't. And we've, we've locked in the attack, basically. Because now, uh, you know, the knight on f6 is forced now. So we're going for it. And of course, you know what we're going to do next. We're not even going to... I'm threatening knight e4 possibly in some lines. So best is bishop f5. Yeah. Your next move marks you out as a very modern player, Paul. You can lose, <laughs> you can be in 2022. Here There's comes. only one choice now. You've got to go for it. There's only one choice. H4. Yeah, hit him. Now, it seems to be, it seems to come to be known as Harry 4, hasn't it? You know, that yeah, the Harry. Things. Harry. He's Harry does his... Looking I mean, it for all it's worth. Stick the H pawn up. Isn't <laughs> Alf, Alpha Zero is fond of Harry, isn't he? He likes throwing Harry forward, if I remember rightly. Even when the he king's looks. on C8. Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, you, th you, th you start to think, but actually, amazingly enough, 
this is sound and, and the computers tell me that white is now winning but you know at the time one never knew what the hell was going on you know so he played here it's just and of course, to show that h4 is not a, a modern concept just uh, that young whippersnappers must uh <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> watch out so, here we go h5 now you know okay i'm sacrificing a piece uh Again, the best move is probably rook c8. <laughs> Black plays rook c8 to stop bishop coming to c4 is the best. But, uh, you know, he, he just could have taken... You just want to get home, you take the knight. Yeah. Well, bishop yeah. D, uh, after rook c8, though, bishop d3 is quite good, and you sacrifice on g6 instead. And actually, white gets quite a strong attack as well there, apparently. So it's not, it's not completely clear. But he takes this, and so we take on g6. He plays f takes g6. We throw in bishop c4 check and we go king h8. Oh dear. And now we take on g6. Okay. Now, uh, he's under a lot of pressure here. There's lots of moves threatened and uh, he's got to decide what to do. But he plays, he, he plays the natural knight d7. But in this position now, white is a piece down, but he's got a very strong attack. And I think the trouble is, you look at this and you say, well, how am I going to, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to prove my position? And then you notice that you can cut off his defence to the h7 ball. But then you start to look at various things. Can he play bishop e4 in some lines? And you go through all this in your head and you're trying to work it all out. But actually, I have to say, for once in my life, having missed knight takes e4 earlier, which <laughs> Nigel pointed out, I actually did see this when I played h5. So I was quite pleased with myself that I saw this continuation. He had, so we played now bishop f7, which cuts off the defense and threatens rook takes h7 check and mate. So he's in, in, in a dire position now, in dire straits. But he plays the natural move, which is what the, the move that he thought would, I think he'd seen this move himself and he thought this would give him uh, defense and allow him to defend the h7 pawn, um, you know, through by, via the bishop. But he missed something here, and I was pleased that I'd seen it a few moves back. Oh, yes. And as you can see, the dramatic queen takes e4 oh, is the move. Because if he goes knight takes e4, then we've got rook takes h7 mate, which is a nice mate. So in this position, uh, if he takes on f7, I can take knight takes, queen takes, and then the rook on h8, a8 is on priest as well. I take that back. So I've then got two exchanges up. I'm, I'm happy with two exchanges up against the grandmaster. So uh, he resigned. So that was a bit of fun. It was a hack. It was a hack. And, you know, you don't get those very often, but um, that just shows to show you the danger of, you know, leaving that queen on h6 for too long, basically. It's it kind of um, hurt him. <laughs> <Say that again>. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all a bit of fun, all yeah. a bit of fun. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it shows you. I mean, I, as I say, I don't play games like that very often. You've seen a couple of my games <coughs> against Andrews and against uh, Willie Watson. But I would say my style is more the sharp type of style. The game against Miles probably reflects the style more, you know, with a positional edge, sharp with a positional edge, you know? Yeah. There we are. Paul, tell us, tell us something about your, your career choice, right? Because you, uh, I think you, you were teaching up to one point, weren't you? And then, uh, and then you went into um, uh, the finance industry. Yes, I think, I, I think the thing is then, at, at that stage, uh, when I decided to become a teacher, I'd also got married. And um, you have to make a decision, really, in your life, you know, only just then people were starting to think about being professional. Tony Miles, for example, uh, Ray Keane, and various people were starting to think about being professional. And it was very much the start of the professional chess life in Britain. Nowadays, a lot of the youngsters have, have become professionals, and people like Moral Kevin, Keith Arkell, and so on are all good examples. But at those days, getting married, having children, getting a job was the norm. And we were all amateurs, basically, who, who, who would just want to enjoy our chess and, and um, instead, you know, forge out a career. 
so I, I got married. Uh, I got a job as a teacher. I had uh, my first child in 1979, Jonathan. And then in 1981, funnily enough, at the end of August, I had my second child, Katie. And of course, having just won the British in 1981, that was rather nice that, uh, you know, that my second child was also born. But as you could imagine, making a decision to become a professional chess player then is virtually impossible when you've got two children because yeah. it's a very uncertain career. And to, to take that on without the, the financial backing is quite difficult. Yeah. Um, but having won the British Championship, I was invited to, 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 to play in a zonal. But to my horror, my headmaster said, you could play. And then he changed me changed his mind and said, no, I'm sorry, you can't play in the zone because you're away from school for too long. And I understand that he was very upset by that. And at that point, I thought, well, do I really want to be a teacher? Funny enough, it was, I was starting to think about other things. And Peter Sowery, as we all know, is a, quite a good chess player. He'd gone into work for Phillips and Drew in London. And I asked him if there was a possibility of working for Phillips and Drew stockbrokers in London. He said, yes, there is. And he put my name forward and I got an interview and I got a job. And so I joined Phillips and Drew and I started to work in the city. And of course, that enabled me to then work for various people. I worked for Goldman Sachs. I worked for JP Morgan, the big investment banks. And it enabled me to obviously uh, get a financial footing. And that was a very important part. The disappointing thing is, though, is that it stopped me really from becoming a grandmaster because I think to become a grandmaster, I would have needed to turn professional and to really dedicate my life to chess. And that's something, obviously, a decision I made. Yeah. But nonetheless, you, I, I'm actually very impressed when I realise in your timeline, you, you, you won the Commonwealth Championship in 1985. That was with two kids already. Two, two or more than two, just two. Uh... Are you sure you're right there? What are you talking about? I think, I think it was 85, the Commonwealth I don't think I won the Commonwealth Championship. I thought you did. Or was it Kevin Spraggett? But you were very... Uh, you were very we were close. I didn't do too badly. I didn't win, but I, I did okay. And uh, I did okay. I, I, I still played. I represented England and various things, and I did, did okay. But I never... I think if I could have dedicated more time to it, I, I think I could have become a Grandmaster. And I, You needed to play... I mean, because Hastings, for instance, I played... Mm. And the experience of playing against the really top players, yeah. for instance, I played Ulf Anderson and people like this, and Smizlov, and playing against these top players is such an experience and a learning curve, and you need yeah. to do it more often. The more chances you get, the better you get, and you, you start to understand how you need to play and how you need to concentrate. I mean, in lots of these people, I got good games, but I just couldn't finish it off, and they were yeah. just resilient, so resilient, you know, and it's a good lesson. Well, I, I found uh, East, Eastern European tournaments, especially the, uh, I played a couple of tournaments in Russia, and those were, you know, tremendous from a, a development point of view. And I also played a, a 15 round tournament in uh, Renatska Banya, which lasted three weeks, because they had, they had adjournment days and rest days. So, so in the middle of nowhere for three weeks, you know, with nothing to do but the chess and, you know, hopefully you brought, you know, you took along a few novels or something. But it's incredibly time consuming. You yes. know, there's, there's just like no way that you can do this and, you know, uh, have any kind of normal life. Uh, no, it's very difficult. And I, I think, I think uh, you know, when uh, my wife now and my previous wife, uh, my first wife, occasionally came to a tournament, but <clears throat> frankly... You know, it's no life for a wife being at a chess tournament because, yeah. as you can imagine, I'm concentrating, I'm trying to prepare, and I, I'm just not very interesting. I'm a total bore, basically, for anyone you know, <laughs> you're concentrating, completely concentrating on the chess, and you are just an absolutely, you know... Hungry. Well, you, you can hang out with other bores, you know. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's what you do. You hang out. Anyway, I'm pleased to say that I am, um, I have actually been selected to play in the... Uh, over 65 world seniors team so i'm going to be playing in that in italy this year so I'm trying to get a bit more chess in now uh, you know in the senior level having had a you know not so much in, in my 30s 40s and 50s so coming back to it a bit more now well those those old guys won't know what hits them when your h pawn starts charging down the board <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and John Nunn's on board one as well, and he'll be throwing you know, pieces at everybody. You know. So it's, it's a nice team, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay. Well, it's been, uh, yeah, it's been a real pleasure having you on the show. And, um, you know, thanks very much for coming and, and showing us your games and everything. Um, have you got any, any parting words? <laughs> Before parting I take words. this offline. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, just, just enjoy it. Go for it and, you know, enjoy it. And, uh, you know, chess is that kind of game. Don't, don't be too scared. Just get, in, get involved and enjoy it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks very much, Paul. And uh, we will hopefully see you again sometime. Indeed. Very, yeah. very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, okay. thanks Andrew. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank Cheers, you. Sir. Thank you. Bye. Bye.